Good morning, welcome to the Mid Bible Class. I'd like to thank the radio station for this a lot of time. But most importantly, we've come this morning to praise and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Bob, could you lead your word of prayer, please? Let's bow our hair. Let's, let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, it's a great day. Today's your day, and we lift you up in praise. We thank you for being a loving God, a merciful God. Dear Lord, we thank you for the rain, the, the rain that you have brought on this land and made it so beautiful. And we pray that your ears will be open, that you may hear the word of God from the message that we deliver today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate those prayers. I hope everybody's having an absolutely wonderful Sunday morning. Beautiful day the Lord has made for us. Uh, been a good week. Friday night we had a graduation. Graduation of seniors. Of course, you had during the day you had kids going from kindergarten to elementary school or middle school, then middle school going to high school and vice versa. But Friday night the seniors got their time. They graduated and been through school for 12 years. It's time for them to hit the world, whether it be college or work, or one way or the other. But we need to remember and remind ourselves that we are they're still a part of this community, and we need to still continue to lift them up in prayer. I was mowing yesterday, doing my weekly chores, and we're blessed to mow because the Lord gave us about how many inches of rain, so it's a grassing group. That's right. So it's a good thing. But as I was born, I was listening to music and Christian music coming on, and the Spirit, Holy Spirit hit me like I said, oh my goodness gracious. And I try to be obedient, and I pray this was where I am this morning. And Lord reminded me, he said, not only did we have a graduation Friday night, but I've been having a pretty good graduation for about the last month and a half. And he reminded me of the people that he had called home for the last month and a half, a month and a half from our little community. Been a long, been a strong graduation class. Been a lot of people. So if you don't mind this morning, just as Superintendent Renee Schultz stood on the podium the other night, she called names out for the seniors. I'd like to, for us to remind ourselves of some of the names that have been called home to God's heaven and graduation class the last month and a half. See if we can get through this. Louis don't cry. Amanda Maracle, Marple. Romero Ram Castillo, E.S. Herring, Lewis Ferguson, Bill Ruth, John Henry Ball, Carl Owings, George Glenn Red Stevens, Adelaide Copeland, Dr. May Gregg, Roy Vernon Moore, Corrine Susie Snyder, Tyler Allen Eckert, Anelia Chrismore, Hollis Wayne Walker, Barbara Kraft, School Kraft, Bill Bevins, Louise Alsa, also, I'm sorry, A.J. Ivy Jr., Ruth James, Jackie Crumbly, Josh Butler, Tom Sissel. Now I'm sure as they met Jesus at the heavenly gates, the Lord said, Welcome home, good and faithful servant. Here is your reward. Jerry, let's sing a song.
Praise God. Thank you, I <laughs> It's going to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> if I were preaching in a church, I might just say, let's pass the plate. <laughs> this has been quite, a, quite inspiring. But it goes right along with, uh, you know, what I want to talk about a little bit today. This is, uh, has been, as far as I'm concerned, Memorial Week. It wasn't just Memorial Day. Monday morning, I, uh, I had never been to the Memorial Day flag placing ceremony here in Junction. And I was off this week, so I was going to go. And it got rained out, but that's okay. But I'd like to talk a little bit, kind of extend this just a little bit more. Matthew chapter 5, and the Beatitudes we're told. In verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now this nation is the most benevolent that has ever before or ever will be after, I'm sure, that has ever been. We give, and as part of the as part of it, we we ourselves give. Our taxes are Whatever we do, our simple sales tax, we actually, we all give. We give a, a lot. Given more to charity over the years than any other nation, and I think it could probably be, be proved that we might give more to charity, more to third world nations than all other nations put together. Now, there are some up and coming now, and that is a very good thing. But we come to the point where now, our economy is not that, uh, not like it was, and we're actually borrowing money to give to people. We're borrowing money that we don't have to give to people. But how great is that? How, how great is that? The Bible tells us to give the first fruit, and this country does, gives it right off of the top, over and over and over. We sell uh, cereal grain, we can raise more wheat, corn, etc. in about five counties of the Panhandle of Texas and the whole nation needs. And the rest of it we sell or give away to countries that just pay us, a, uh, barely pay the cost of shipping. And we do it, we don't gripe about it. We have been called arrogant a few times, but that's okay. That's okay. At one point, the, the biggest buyer, the largest buyer of wheat worldwide from this country was Iraq. I drove a truck back there and I loaded some stuff down at Freeport <clears throat> and I'd like to go down to the docks and watch them load those ships and they're loading ship after ship after ship freighter of wheat and so I talked to a few people and I said where's this going? It's going to Iraq. It's going to Iraq. The same year, they absolutely <coughs> turned on us, turned on us. The U.S. almost single-handedly rebuilt Europe. Not only Western Europe, but the, even, the, even the countries that fought against us. We, uh, we rebuilt that thing at great expense. We rebuilt Japan. Japan's economy was so horrible. At one time, right after World War II, I lived with my grandparents and went to school. And Grandma Leffler had the name of some people in Germany with, our, <coughs> with the name Leffler, actually related to us, I guess. And at that time, you could, through your service organization, you could send like a shoebox full of Wheaties and <coughs> a few canned goods, a few staples. You could actually get it over there to them. And then Mrs. Leffer would write back, and she would always thank. She would always thank us. Things are so terrible there. She said, "There's no money. There's no economy. There's no job. There is no food." And one letter she wrote, I'll never forget it. She said, uh, "We found where the Allies were dumping 
garbage, and we went, and we loaded sacks full of potato peels. And we all came home and cooked them and got stout. Stout is a German word for full. Well, we all got stout, but uh, it was tainted. And we all got very sick. But praise the Lord, nobody died. In this country, we built, we built for those people as much as we could. Sons and daughters, a lot of them died in that conflict, in the conflict before that one, in the conflict after that one, in the conflicts over the years, many, many, many. That's why we celebrate Memorial Day. So many people are buried there in, uh, in Europe. And adding, kind of adding on to what Joe was talking about, we might want to look back and realize that 12,000 soldiers are buried in Belgium, 44,000 in France, 14,000 in the Mios Agron Cemetery alone, 4,500 in Europe, 12,000 in Italy, 5,000 in Luxembourg. These are men and women that gave their lives. They gave more than out of their pocket. They gave their whole life. Fighting for a country that is built on spiritual and godly principles, which says to give to the needy. Mothers and fathers of this country, this great country, gave up their sons and their daughters. David, King David, is noted for a lot of things, man after God's own heart. He's also noted as the greatest warrior, the greatest soldier, <coughs> if you would, in the, in the Holy Bible. We love all he did. We, we, we love everything that he did. Take everything written about David in the Holy Bible, and it wouldn't be near this thick, would it? But all these men and women that we just mentioned that have died for the service of their country, I think, deserve the same respect that David did, even though there are not books written about them. Van T. Barfoot was born in Edinburgh, Texas, and that probably didn't make the news. But then in 1944, he was an enlisted man fighting in Italy in World War II, and he set out alone to put down a machine gun nest. And doing this, he had to run by himself through a minefield. I don't want any help. I don't want anybody else coming behind me. I'm going to do this. Maybe I'll make it. He did. He made it. And he took out the machine gun nest and two more, single-handedly. Before he returned, he brought back with him 17 German prisoners. Before leaving that theater, he took out three German tanks. And that probably didn't make the news. He received the Medal of Honor, Congressional Medal of Honor for that, and that probably didn't make the news. But this is interesting. What did make the news about this man was that a neighborhood homeowner's Homeowners Association told a crotchety old 90 plus year old man that he could not put up a flag in front of his house. He had already put it up. They told him to take it down. It was on a 22 foot pole and it was flying a, a big, full size flag. They said, No, you can't do this. Uh, this is kind of a, <coughs> a cookie cutter neighborhood. And uh, we don't want anything spectacular like that. You, you may put up a decorative flag on your, on your house, if you wish, uh, kind of like Irma and I have. They might well have looked at this man before they did that. <coughs> they did not back down. They might well, they might have done well to read the citation. They found out that he did not back down for the right cause. The citation is listed in the National Medal of Honor Society. Second Lieutenant Van T. Barefoot, 157th Infantry U.S. Army, 1944. He didn't back down. This country has never backed down either from doing the right thing. All those people died. 
All those people died over there. We need to give them honor and respect. Myself, <clears throat> I was too young for Korea, too old for Nam, and I couldn't volunteer. So I have great respect. My brother did. He said, I'll go for you, brother. And he did. So I have great respect for everyone who has served in the military. Here a while back, my wife went somewhere, and there were three Marines there. And she was selling her pastry, as she, that's the way she makes her living. She sent her pastry, and she told these three guys, these three Marines in uniform, they come out here, I've got something for you. And she opened up the, the back of that expedition, and she had <coughs> cinnamon rolls, she had cake, she had et cetera, all her goodies. And they said, ma'am, we don't have that kind of money. She said, no, take what you want. Take what you want, because I respect you, anyone in uniform. All is it done. All these people died because this country is built on godly principles. Unfortunately, now we're seeing ourselves uh, criticized and called arrogant by some. Some of the nations that we befriended actually rebuilt after these wars. Do not even offer a penance. Do not even offer a dime in support for the conflict that we're in now. The charity that we give is virtual, if you want to put it that way, is virtual agape love. You know what agape love is? Agape love is giving and not expecting anything in return. And boys, that's what we have to do. Because we're not getting it in return. Psalm 35 has been labeled by some as a soldier's song. 91 is another one, but let's look at Psalms 35. And I read to you Psalm 35, 1 through 8. That'll be here somewhere. Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive against me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckle and stand up for my help. And draw out the spear and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those be put to shame who brought to dishonor, who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion, who plot my hurt. Let them be filled, be like chafe before the wind. And let the angel of the Lord chase them, and let their way may be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. Without cause they have uh, hidden their net for me in a pit. When they have done without cause for my life, let destruction come upon them unexpectedly, and let the net that he has hidden catch himself into that very destruction let him fall. It might be something the soldier might say before he goes into battle. I've never been there. In this, at the writing of this, King Saul is nurturing a horrible jealousy against David. In some ways it was natural that he would do this. David was a, uh, Saul was a stately man, tall, handsome, good-looking, and David was but a homely lad, young boy, said his complexion was ruddy, yet he had been willing to go to battle when Saul wasn't. He fought against the giant, slew the giant, that brought him a lot of reputation, of course, and Saul might have wished uh, differently, but that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, the Hebrew ladies at the time sang. Singing was a big thing in the Old Testament. They sang something like, Saul slew hundreds, David slew, slew thousands. <laughs> and this is all that Saul could hear. Oh, he was enraged. And when that happened, Saul's envy didn't know any bounds. 
But there was more to it than that. Saul's son, Jonathan. By this time, David is in hiding, and so and Jonathan went out and, and saw out David, and he found him where he was hiding. And he, we're told in 1 Samuel 23, uh, strengthened his hand in God, gave him encouragement. Seemed like it was only a short visit, but at that time, Jonathan filled in some of the missing pieces for David. Not only did David have Saul to fear, but some of his trusted friends were going out against him as well. He named several that David had always counted on for support. And that is what's happening to us. It's what's happening to us. The background of Psalms 35 is actually where we are today. So just as a soldier must do, David Dillon puts on the full armor of God. And he understands that he has no choice but to fight. He, re he realizes he can do little against the gossip and lies. But he puts on the full armor of God. We read about it in Ephesians chapter 6. He does all he can and is really important to us. There are times when we stand up against an adversary that we have no choice against but to enlist communication with God. And, and that's what he does. He tells God what he hopes God will do for him. In verse 1 through 3 he says, Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive against me. Fight against them. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my cause. Pretty bold things to ask of God. He enlists the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is not mentioned casually. The angel of the Lord came to Hagar when she was kicked out of, out of her home, out of Abraham's household. The angel of the Lord came to Joshua when Joshua was instructed on how to take battle against Jericho. The angel of the Lord appears a few times, and this is pretty, pretty intense. The movie, The End of the Sixth Happiness, is a movie starring Ingram Bergman. And based on the true story of Gladys Allworth, a tenacious British maid, who was a missionary in China before World War II, before the, uh, while the Japanese were over, overwhelming China. The Japanese army was approaching the city where she was. She ran an orphanage with about 100 children and the whole city evacuated. They had to get up over a hundred miles to cross the Yellow River where the Chinese army had uh, fortified itself and was going to make a stand. Then they would be safe. So she's, uh, it had to have been like herding cats, you know, 100 children from 2 to <coughs> 10 or 12 years old. And uh, <coughs> this is a beautiful story, you should read it. Anyway, she's, she's trying to She's trying to make this. It's rain and it's snow and it's mountains and it's trouble. And one time she says, we're not going to make it. We, I can't go. And this little Chinese girl said, remember Moses in the desert? He went on against overwhelming odds too. And Gladys said, yes, but I'm not Moses. The little girl says, and this brings tears to my eyes, but God is still God. And folks, that's where we are. When we stand up against the adversary, we must remember, we must remember that God is still God. I want to close with another song that has actually been mentioned at different times as the song of someone's prayer. And it is Psalms 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him I will trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare and the fowler and from the perilous pestilence, and He shall cover you up with His feathers. And under His wings he shall, you shall take refuge. And the truth shall be your shield and your buckler, and you shall not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks by darkness, 
nor the destruction that lays waste at the noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand. It shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look, and you shall see the reward <coughs> of the wicked. Father God, we do thank you for this time, the fellowship, the fellowship of this community of faith. Father God, we thank you for those who have gone on and paid the price we have not paid. Christ's name, amen. Thank you all. And I see the end of the next Bible class. Thanks.